we're continuing today to look at faith, seeing things God's way. Yesterday, we looked at an event in the life of Elisha when God revealed the armies of heaven to his servant. We saw that the outcome of one person ready to live a life of faith was the change in the fortunes of two nations. And it resulted also in the practice of mercy and grace by others. Well, the person I'd like to look at this morning is a very familiar one to us. It's Simon Peter. And I want to consider a passage that we will all know extremely well, I'm sure. It's in Mark's Gospel and it's in chapter 8. And we will read from verse 27. Mark 8 and verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them, not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. Well, you'll remember that the passage yesterday about Elisha was all about sight, what he saw and what his servants saw. It was about spiritual blindness, but also physical blindness. And this episode in Jesus' life continues that same theme. Immediately before this conversation, Jesus has healed a blind man in Bethsaida. Now, this healing was unusual. Indeed, it is unique in Jesus' ministry because the healing took place in two stages. Sight and the understanding that comes from sight comes slowly. It doesn't all come at once. So the man, when Jesus first touches him, sees people who look like trees walking around. In verse 24, he has begun to see, but he's not yet understood. Jesus then touches him again. And his sight is completely restored. Mark then takes us immediately to the conversation we have just read. Jesus and his disciples travel outside of Israel to the land of the Gentiles. And there is an important message, I think, that lies behind this. The revelation of Jesus as the Messiah, which is about to happen when Peter makes his great statement. This revelation has to take place outside of the land of Israel, outside of the land of the promise, because in that land, where people lived who really ought to be able to see, ought to be able to understand, these people do not see. They do not understand. The message is going to go to the Gentiles. And they will see. They will understand. They will believe. So Jesus asks his disciples who the crowds think he is. And the replies are very positive. They recognise that Jesus is special, that he's right up there with Elijah and with John the Baptist. But this is a little bit like 
the man in Bethsaida. This is seeing trees walking around. It's seeing something, but it's not really understanding it. It's seeing Jesus, but it's not really understanding him. Spiritual sight, spiritual understanding needs to be worked on. And so Jesus then asks his closest disciples, and it is, of course, Simon Peter who responds. It's difficult to keep him quiet on occasions. But here he makes a very profound statement. Like the man in Bethsaida, when Jesus had touched him twice, Peter has begun to see and to understand. He sees that Jesus is the Messiah. This is a revelation that can only have come from God himself. I wonder how Peter felt about this. It's clear he got the right answer. And the other disciples could well have been thinking, I knew that. But it was Peter who said it. I wonder whether a little bit of pride perhaps began to creep into Peter's mind. That at least is what the next part of the story might seem to suggest. Jesus goes on and he explains what it means if he is the Messiah. It will mean suffering. It will mean rejection. Death. And it will mean resurrection. Now, it's interesting that Peter's response to what Jesus says suggests he's heard about the suffering and the rejection and the death. He heard those bits, but he hadn't heard the rise again. Or if he did hear it, he had no idea what it meant. Like many of us, we only listen to bits of what is said, not all of what is said. But Peter had understood that Jesus was the Messiah. The problem was that his understanding of the Messiah was very different from Jesus's understanding. And in a way, Peter was still like that blind man in Bethsaida. He'd seen the Messiah, but he hadn't understood what that meant. He still sees trees walking. And so once again, Peter speaks up. He does this in what he probably thinks is a polite and sensitive way. He takes Jesus to one side. He doesn't want to rebuke his leader in front of all of them. And obviously he tries to explain to Jesus why his, Jesus's view of the Messiah, is the wrong one. Ah yes, the pride. It's perhaps turned to a little bit of arrogance. And so Jesus has to rebuke Peter. And he does it in the strongest terms possible. Peter's thought is not just a wrong thought. Peter's view of the Messiah was an anti-Jesus thought. It was, in fact, truly satanic. And note that Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter quietly. This is not because he is less pastorally sensitive than Peter. It's because he knows that what Peter says, the others think. Or at least that what Peter says, the others will perhaps come to think. That is, of course, what happens with the leaders. And it's why leadership is a treacherous position to hold. Peter had seen that Jesus was the Messiah. But he still had, I think, a view which expected the powerful overthrow of the Roman occupiers by force. And perhaps Peter anticipated the, um, the, the horses and the chariots of fire from the story yesterday to come down and to be the ones that destroy the Romans. What Peter had not understood was that the victory that Jesus was going to bring about would come through defeat. Death would be defeated by dying. Sin by Jesus becoming sin. In other words, Peter needed to see things from God's perspective. And that is, in fact, exactly 
what Jesus says to him. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Seeing things God's way, seeing with the eyes of faith, is going to demand a complete turning upside down of human expectations and anticipation. And that is turning upside down was really only something the disciples understood after the resurrection. But I wonder whether we have understood it. Of course, we say we have. But seeing things God's way means that our lives cannot be built on the same understanding as the world's. This becomes even clearer in the next piece of teaching from Jesus. He now speaks not just to his disciples, but to the crowd. And he sets before them the challenge, the demands that will come through being one of his disciples. And those demands are really, really tough. Jesus makes clear that following him means a readiness to die, to give up themselves and their lives. Why? Because what is on offer is even greater. And that's a really tough one for us. We play games with this, I think. We talk about all of us having our cross to bear when we really mean I've had a cold or my car has broken down. But when Jesus talks about carrying a cross, he's talking about carrying the means of our execution, the means of our death. That's the challenge of following Jesus. Are we ready to die? Do we hold our lives in a higher regard and of a higher value than serving Jesus? Paul had understood this. So in his letter to the Galatians, he writes this. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And do we really believe that? That's the challenge for those of us who say we're disciples and followers of Jesus. That's the challenge of truly seeing things God's way, of truly living by faith. Do we consider ourselves as already dead so that we can live for Christ? Mm -hmm.